Thanks, Tiggy, and good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wayne and Joe. Uh, our panel this morning is going to uh, pick up some of the themes that were mentioned in the governor's talk about particular uh, risks that are facing the um, uh, banking industry, and then to get on to questions of how uh, uh, regulation might uh, evolve in, in response to those. Uh, and so I thought I'd start on the subject of the digital economy. Um, our Aussies are, love technology, it's accelerated through uh, um, uh, COVID, um, it's an integral part of the financial system now, but it's probably only going to increase even further. Joe, how do you see that changing the way that ASIC looks at corporate regulation and what its role is, particularly in the, the recovery mm. of the economy? Well, I don't think there's a single aspect of what ASIC does that isn't affected by technology, and that's just, just going to increase. Uh, so crypto has been, the, the governor's actually mentioned all the key themes. The, we had the crypto phenomenon, we had the, the payment system issues, um, and we're also in an environment where I mean, data has become such a dominant part of everything. And so one, one of the issues for even ASIC for itself is to ensure that it is data enabled and, and is able to engage in this digital uh, operating environment. And I talk to the banks and other businesses and the, I think everybody's business model is affected by this. And so the way we regulate that has to be aligned with the challenges of a digital uh, format. Uh, so from uh, the other issues associated with that, if I may say so, are complexity. And so we have a proliferation of payment systems, and we have a regulatory regime, which, as the governor's noted, and I think we all accept, uh, is in need of reform. Uh, I think the Farrell view is a very significant piece of work. So there are all these things are coming together, and we haven't got a lot of time to deal with these issues. So I think that's the challenge. It's the combination of the uh, de digitization, the complexity, and the fact that our uh, regulatory settings aren't quite there now. They need to change. So that's just maybe taking payments as an example. Um, we have a good system. Everyone wants innovation. Everyone wants convenience. There are so many new entrants, whether they're small local startups or they're international uh, companies are piling in. So how do, you, how do you see regulation evolving? so that it, it, it balances both innovation yeah. on the one hand, but consumer protection yeah. on the other. Well, the, the two should go hand in hand, but I think it's well to, for all of us to remember that at the end of the day, the system is there for all Australians. So part of my job, and ASIC's job, is to ensure that whatever it is we end up with, um, our consumers uh, uh, feel confident dealing with those systems. They know how to look up to, to take steps in their own interest. Now, we all know there's been a lot of publicity lately, and regrettably, I have to confirm it, is that the, we, are, we haven't seen an increase in scams. It's clear that a lot of Australians are getting caught up with a range of um, you know, fraudsters and scamsters online. So whatever payment systems uh, or new payment systems we move to, we have to take into account that they're secure. And the, I keep mentioning complexity because everybody likes simplicity. Uh, I think one of the challenges for government is sort of a digital delivery of services, it's, se it's seamless, it's easy to work with. So I think the challenge for all of us is to come up with a simple way of uh, um, engaging with regulation or with government services, but in a way that's secure and it makes consumers confident that they know who they're dealing with and they're not going to lose their money. Um, and of course all that's happening more and more quickly. So. The expectations are very high. People have low tolerance for waiting. and So all that has to be balanced up. I suppose that raises issues as to the role for prudential regulation, doesn't it, in terms of, uh, uh, of payments providers? Yeah, because um, I think you, you touched on everyone absolutely wants innovation. Uh, everyone wants convenience. Uh, and no one wants risk. And that's <laughs> always the challenge, is to, to get that balance right. Uh, and so in, in a sort of a regulatory world, important, it's important that regulators uh, stay up to speed, but it's equally important they don't try and get ahead. 
uh, we need uh, a sufficient regulatory framework that actually allows those that want to innovate, those that want to compete to do so, sort of knowing the rules of the game and, and with enough freedom in the rules of the game to do that. But that regulators aren't getting too far ahead or, or trying to uh, head off issues that actually don't really exist. So what's important, I think, from a, uh, whether it's a prudential perspective or a conduct perspective or a payment system efficiency uh, effect, uh, perspective that, that uh, the Reserve Bank would be interested in, is that we don't look at those things in isolation, but we are trying to look at it from a whole of government, whole of community perspective. Um, Joe talked about the Farrell Review, and I think, uh, take the Farrell Review, the Senate Select Committee report, the Andrew Bragg uh, report, uh, they're giving us a really good whole of government uh, roadmap, a useful roadmap that tries to find that right balance between allowing the innovation, allowing the competition, uh, allowing the benefits to flow to the community, uh, while at the same time balancing the, the consumer um, protection needs. And so as we think about it, I think the most important thing, not knowing where it will all play out, not knowing how it evolved, not knowing which technologies will be successful, the important thing for regulators like us and, and, and ASIC and others who are in this game is really just to make sure we get the basics right. And the basics are making sure regulatory frameworks are technology neutral, um, making sure there's principles based, and then making sure that as they're framed up, they're framed up from a whole system perspective. Wayne, if I could pick up one thread from that, and one particular risk, cyber risk. Yes. Uh, obviously, it's critically important in the banking sector. There's new legislation coming through, and the um, security legislation amendment, critical infrastructure bill is being wound up. Banking and insurance, obviously, critical infrastructure for that service. Uh, how is that work? And say the Australian Cyber Security Centre body, how is that going to interact with APRA either as a planning matter or actually in an incident? Uh, so it's a big, it's clearly a big broad topic and it's, it's very much uh, high on the agenda, not just for APRA, but for all of the Council of Financial Regulator Agencies. In the same way, it's high on the agenda for everyone that's in the, in the financial system. Um, I mean, there's no lack of awareness of the issue. That's the first and most important thing. Uh, there's no complacency, I think, through the financial system or the regulatory community about the importance of the issue. Everyone's constantly investing uh, in people, in systems, in partnerships, in testing, uh, doing the best they can to make sure that they're ready for whatever the latest threat is. And that, that is uh, the heart of the challenge, that the job's never done, the adversaries keep evolving, it's not like most of the other risks that financial institutions deal with and regulators try and regulate in the sense that this, we have an active adversary constantly trying to test the boundaries and defeat the controls that are in place. If I think about the financial system from a couple of dimensions, cyber resilience, uh, I think we can take a degree of comfort and never, as I said, never want to be complacent, but talking to, um, you know, other regulators, the Australian Cyber Security Centre, Home Affairs, others who are involved in the exercise. I think the financial system, you know, at least in a relative sense, relative to other parts of the broader um, commercial sector in Australia, is seen to be relatively strong. And if I also compare notes with um, peer regulators overseas, I think the Australian banking system also probably shapes up pretty well or ranks pretty well in terms of its its, uh, its position and, and readiness uh, and resilience to cyber attacks. So, um, sort of pick up on one of Phil's earlier points. I think we've got a good foundation, but we can't be complacent. And particularly, be, we can't be complacent because what have we learnt from recent incidents? Well, uh, we've learnt from recent incidents, Acelion, Log4j, whatever it might be, that quite often, banks themselves will have their house in quite good order, but it's the increasing use of service providers and third party suppliers who are introducing the vulnerabilities. And that is the biggest regulatory challenge that we, I think we have, and also that's occupying the minds of the international standard setting bodies, just how we think about a banking system which is no longer, 
you know, no longer is a bank a big stone building with a computer in the back. It, it's it's uh, increasingly uh, an organisation and an ecosystem with service providers providing critical services, and we need to be equally confident those service providers uh, are as resilient as, as the, the bank itself. So that then gets to the, the sort of um, heart of your question, which is how is the landscape changing, particularly with the new critical infrastructure bill, uh, and a bigger role for other parts of government in overseeing cyber resilience in the financial system. Um, you asked uh, how does our role change, well uh, in one sense our role doesn't change, we're still the, the prudential supervisor, we still have a significant interest in cyber resilience and, and making sure that is as robust as it can be. Our prudential standards of CPS 234 on information security and, and our other standards around operational resilience still apply. Um, but clearly now we have this new player on the playing field in home affairs and, and the critical infrastructure centre that, that is stepping in from a, a broader Australia-wide perspective or, you know, banking and finance is just one of 11 sectors which are now going to be subject to uh, their interest, if I can put it that way. Um, what's really important, I think, to, just to emphasise is that um, there's actually been really good engagement between the financial sector regulators and home affairs in, in the thinking about how this new regime is going to work. And um, they're quite conscious of the need not to produce duplicate regimes or parallel regimes. So we're working actively on a model that says uh, that banks already have a regulatory regime around cybersecurity in place, the APRA regimes that exist. We don't need to duplicate that. So to the extent there are risk management program requirements in the critical infrastructure bill, we can leverage and indeed maybe just substitute for the APRA uh, standards. Um, uh, there's requirements around making sure they identify ownership of critical assets, but that's already covered by APRA standards, so we can think about whether there's a need for anything else. There will clearly be some areas where uh, their requirements will exceed our current requirements, and in particular around reporting of cyber incidents. Um, and there we'll have a look at what we, we ask for and see how we can align them. So the point I'm really trying to make in this um, long-winded answer is, uh, yes, there's a new player on the field, uh, and they're looking beyond the financial system, you know, with a broader Australia-wide perspective. So a slightly different role, slightly different perspective, but the agencies are absolutely working to, uh, together to make sure that what we end up with is a set of requirements around cyber resilience which are as effective as they can be uh, but also as efficient as they can be. Thanks. Let's, let's go. It seems a bit rude to people who come up with crypto assets to brand them immediately next to cyber security risks. Uh, but commentary about the dangers of cryptocurrency for investors are rife at the moment, whether it's the AFP, whether it's uh, ASIC's own warnings. And yet it appears quite widespread. I think the ATO have said 800,000 Australians have got it, and I know when my daughter comes home from university, she tells me the computer science students are happily trading in small amounts of cryptocurrency. Uh, um, Joe, what's, what's the approach for this uh, phenomenon? Well, it's a new phenomenon, but uh, the, I think from my perspective, and ASIC's perspective, our, our, obviously our starting point is our own responsibilities over financial products and services, but the, clearly the current regime doesn't go far enough in dealing with um, this new asset class uh, of cryptocurrency. And as Wayne mentioned, uh, there was a Farrell review and of course it was Senator Bragg's inquiry, which really, I think, did some excellent work in, in crystallising, well, what are the key points or issues that um, Parliament and uh, us as a society need to you know, confront uh, to deal with this. The, uh, I suppose from my perspective, I think the key points are that the cryptocurrencies are a new asset class, and I think for many Australians, that there's a real issue about whether they understand what it is they're investing in. 
and secondly, the, we just don't have the traditional protections. So e even to talk about cryptocurrencies is um, in itself, there are some thousands of versions of these currencies that can be traded anywhere on the world. Um, and this clearly generate a lot of excitement. It's deemed to be innovative. So all of these, thi all of these things have to be taken into account. But the, I think the quicker we're able to um, uh, uh, regulate <laughs> this space in a way that um, gets the balance right between wanting to be innovative uh, and consumer protection and investor protection, I think the better. I mean, as things stand, I am very concerned that the, we are dealing with a rapidly growing um, asset class or interest um, that I think many Australians don't really appreciate is outside of the normal uh, um, perimeter of regulation and uh, protection. And I think this is a, something that I know the government has focused on, the Council of Financial Regulators and Treasury are working very closely together at the moment. And I think we can expect, um, I think, a paper uh, being published in the next month or so that will um, do some heavy lifting on the policy side uh, because there's some very, I think, uh, complex decision making to be made as to where Parliament lands on this. Now, as far as ASIC is concerned, I think there's a foreshadowed role for us uh, to license uh, uh, di digital currency exchanges. I think there's an existing licensing regime um, that uh, I think is careful consideration should be given to extending that to um, uh, this activity. I think there are a lot, a lot of people in this space that are, um, welcome uh, some regulation and want to see this sector put on a, a sounder footing uh, for the very good reason that in the end we want consumers and investors to be confident in, in their investment decisions and to make their own investment decisions and make their own uh, decisions about what risks they're prepared to take. But as things stand, we're not quite there yet. I think there's a lot of work ahead of us. And the only thing I'd say, as I said a while, a, a moment ago, uh, I think this work's urgent. You know, I think the, the growth in this space, I mean, in the short time I've been chair, uh, people ask me, oh, well, you know, how's it going? And I, I was a bit surprised at how quickly um, this um, phenomenon has grown and has assumed a lot more of my time than I expected before I started. So this is something that requires attention. It's getting attention. But we need to, I think we do need to make these decisions as quickly as we can. I look forward to the legislation. <laughs> Going from crypto to climate. Um, Wayne, the uh, climate vulnerability assessment is underway for the uh, uh, for five large banks, and I think we'll see the results later in 2022. What else is on the APRA to-do list regarding climate? Uh, well, just to step back, so what did we do last year? We really had two pieces of work last year in climate. Uh, the first was the um, finalising the Prudential Practice Guide, which we got finished at the end of last year and published. And that was designed to provide guidance to industry on how to, in a sense, make good decisions and deal with many of the issues that Phil highlighted in his earlier remarks. Um, and then we have the Climate Vulnerability Assessment, which is the more targeted exercise with the five large banks and really trying to get in uh, a much stronger analytical framework for understanding how the impacts from uh, what is a global phenomenon will translate, not just to a national level, but even yeah, um, to regions and industries, etc. cetera. Um, so on the, on the climate vulnerability assessment, that work is, is still going. Uh, I do want to acknowledge the hard work and cooperation of the banks who are involved in that exercise. It's been a very much a cooperative effort between the the regulatory community, um, APRA leading it, but with, with support from the other regulatory agencies around the council as well, and then the banks. Um, we all have an interest in trying to get this right. It's tricky work to translate these global scenarios into, into local, local climate scenarios and then local economic scenarios. So uh, it, it's, um, it's hard work, but we're, we're chipping away at it, making good progress, and we'll have Hopefully, we'll have uh, some results that we can talk about in you know, the middle of the year or shortly afterwards. And, um, and then we'll think about what we've learned from that exercise, uh, how easy was it, how hard was it, and how can we expand uh, the nature of the, that analysis to 
other sectors. I mean, I think there's a, a clear case to think, in, and it's obvious in events over the past two weeks, we need to think harder about not just what climate means for uh, the banking system, but the insurance sector as well has clearly um, got some significant issues ahead of it. Then uh, the other piece of work which we'll do this year is to, having, having published the practice guide, is to, um, is to look and see how well uh, it's being applied. Is it being applied? Is it useful? Uh, so we recently sent to about 80 odd larger financial institutions a, a voluntary survey. Um, it's a pretty simple survey to fill in, but it's designed to give us some feedback on the extent to which the sorts of ideas and practices that are in the practice guide are uh, being used or able to be used or intending to be used. Is the guidance helpful uh, to help financial institutions make better decisions? So we'll, um, we'll get that back. That'll be useful for us in, in helping us understand the maturity across the industry in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of understanding climate and being able to uh, manage the risks that come from climate change. But also, we want to use that to be able to give feedback to the participating institutions and help them understand about how they rank and their own capabilities and maturity relative to their peers and others in the industry. So they're the sort of two key pieces of work for APRA this year. Uh, we're actively engaged, you know, more generally, in the, the myriad of financial, um, of international sort of working groups and task force that exist. There's, there's in fact too many of them in my view. And, uh, uh, but you know, every international body has significant uh, work going on on climate and uh, even to the point where you find yourself getting involved in stock takes that various uh, standard setting bodies are doing on what, what each country is doing on climate and then another international body decides to do a stock take of the stock takes. So there's a lot of work going on, but um, notwithstanding there's a little bit of bureaucracy, uh, it is useful for us to be engaged in those things, to hear what's happening, to make sure we have a voice in uh, what's happening overseas and uh, have the opportunity to influence because we will see more standards in this place, more regulation, uh, uh, international uh, climate standards are coming and Joe might want to talk about those. Uh, and it's important Australia's got a voice at, a ta uh, at the table and able to, to influence those things. So um, I'll stop there. Touching on international standards and then also moving towards a uh, question about disclosure. Um, some of the standards will introduce, say, taxonomies. The thinking comes from overseas. Do we need to adapt that when we come to this country in the same way that we might do with capital standards to some extent? So. Uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll yeah. a quick go. I think the short answer is we probably will need yeah. to because I think um, any, any international standard uh, or indeed any... So, you know, there are taxonomies that are being introduced for regions of the world, you know, a European taxonomy, et cetera. They'll nat naturally have a, a specific focus. And just as we do with you know, traditional prudential capital requirements, we take the international standards and then think about how they work here. So it's important we have a voice in those um, areas and try and influence the international developments. We're also supporting this, you know, there's a number of private sector um, initiatives in Australia and happy to also be supportive of those because I think all, every one of those initiatives is helpful. Um, but inevitably, we will need something that's fit for purpose yeah. in Australia. Joe? I think they're all, all the right points to make. What I would add to that is that the critical thing from my perspective is we all have to acknowledge we're part of a global capital market. <laughs> and so we do have a voice. Um, but our voice may not be as loud as other voices, and we have to be a bit realistic about um, where we're going to land with these standards. Now, at the moment, um, the, there is, I think, a, a development of mandatory standards uh, coming out of Europe and the US and other jurisdictions. We don't have that approach yet in this space. Um, I'm open-minded about where we should land, but I think the, as, as Wayne says, if I've, this topic really does have a global uh, uh, aspect to it. We're at the early stages of really getting a grip on it. And as Phil Lowe said, 
if, if we're going to be able to participate in um, uh, uh, global capital markets, attract the investment that we want to, and in fact, in fact, not lose investment as a result of, of um, miscalculating in this space, then I think uh, we will need to be, be aligning ourselves more with what's going on offshore. Now, where we land in the end, there's a way to go. But the, again, this is another topic of some urgency because there's so many markets are affected by the fact that we don't have uh, comparable standards and investors are you know, left wondering. The, the only other couple of topics I would raise is that the, um, I think ASIC is concerned about greenwashing. I think we're uh, doing a lot of work with other regulators, uh, the ACCC and others, um, where we're looking at how, frankly, consumers, uh, you know, the green uh, theme, um, it's very hard to walk into any retail outlet or any part of the community life without a green theme emerging. Uh, and, very, and so ASIC is concerned that, about misleading and deceptive conduct in that area. And of course, that again goes back to, well, being able to assess objectively statements made in this space, are they true or not? And, and how do we um, assess objectively their truth? And as Phil Lowe highlighted, that this really matters because if we get that wrong, there'll be misallocation of capital and consumers will be misled and it, it leads to outcomes that are just not in, in the interests of the economy uh, and in the general community. Uh, hopefully we'll see some um, clarification as the year unfolds, but as Wayne says, the, there is a, a lot of work going on, but it'd be good if it could be, progress could be made to sort of um, crystallise where we land on it. But the, uh, I think it is in Australia's interest to be internationally aligned and at the moment we're not quite there yet, I don't think. Let's get to the future and perhaps a, a, a wrap-up question to the, each of you. Um, there's a focus on regulatory efficiency, and Joe, you have a regulatory efficiency unit. What's that for? Yeah. And what does it want to achieve? Well, we're, we're, it's, it's, got, it's complementing ASIC's existing activities, but the, uh, through the unit, uh, we're talking to a wide range of market professionals, practitioners, uh, industry associations. And, and what I'm interested in there is where ASIC can um, improve its engagement with industry. We, ha we have existing engagement mechanisms when we publish policy, we go through various processes. I think there's room for improvement in the way in which we go about that. Uh, secondly, there's, we've been talking a lot about data and technology uh, this morning. Well, I, the, and uh, ASIC's um, uh, in the middle of uh, a data uplift and transformation uh, strategy that we're working on. But I, I, I'm looking for business cases of being able to apply that thinking now, in the next 12 or 18 months. Uh, for example, with breach reporting, uh, we've been working with the ABA to streamline um, the way we receive uh, breaches, uh, breach reports, and then what we do with them when we do receive them. Uh, under the legislation, we're going to be um, uh, pr pr uh, publishing what we've learned from the first set of um, breach reports, in fact, in November. Well, that implies data enablement. That, that implies data analytics. How are we going to do that? How, how good will that information be and how useful will it be to the banks and the community? All that goes to our, our technology approach and the regulatory efficiency unit is there to hear what people have to say about that and how we can improve in that area. Uh, but in the end, the, um, I think we can all accept that the corporation's legislation is very complex. Um, it affects everybody. It's, um, it's something I've spoken about publicly before. I'm very concerned about the complexity of that legislation and looking for ways um, of administering it uh, to reduce frictions for business and to make us more effective. So all of those things, there are other things the unit's working on as well, but they're, they're some of the key themes. And Wayne, the... Um Banking system has held up remarkably through the stresses of COVID. Hopefully it is now unquestionably strong. But what other aspects of prudential regulation or the architecture do you want to modernise? Uh, so, absolutely right. I mean, we can all, I think, be very proud of the resilience of the banking system through uh, the last couple of years because a lot has been thrown at it and it's actually been 
uh, a source of strength for the broader community. Um, that has been a product of a lot of investment that followed from obviously back to the global financial crisis, a lot of regulatory reform, a lot of change working through the system. What, uh, so we, we absolutely have a strong system, um, but what all of that reform has unfortunately produced, and many people in this room know this very well, is it's rather large and unwieldy rule book. And so uh, one of the things that we have set ourselves a task for in a, uh, one of our core strategic initiatives is to, is to modernise that prudential architecture. Um, to step back and look at it and say, you know, it's, it's big, it's cumbersome, maybe not as big as the Corpse Act or something like that, but nonetheless, <laughs> uh, not, a, not easy to navigate, not easy to find regulatory requirements, not easy to map regulatory requirements. So can we, can we step back and have a look at it? Can we, make, can we streamline it? Can we make it easy to understand and navigate? Can we easy, make it easier for us and financial institutions to update, uh, understand what they have to do and, and make it easier to adapt as new things come along? Um, so that's an ambitious task. It'll be a multi-year task, but I think there's plenty of scope to do it, to digitise the Prudential framework. We still live in a world where Prudential standards, you know, are PDF documents. It's, uh, it's, uh, we've got a lot of scope to, to do better uh, on that score, so we're absolutely determined to do that. One of the uh, things that we do want to do in the short term is just talk to industry about how uh, fast and ambitious we want to be on that project because we, we very much hear the complaints about regulatory burden, we very much hear the complaints about the complexity of the regulatory system, uh, but to change that does involve time and effort and resources and cost and there's a trade-off to be had there about how quickly we can remove some of that burden. It will involve effort and cost on the, on the industry to harness those those benefits we think we can deliver, but we're absolutely determined that the project is delivering benefits to the industry. Uh, and so we need to work in partnership with the industry to make sure that we can do that as efficiently as we can, but without creating a new regulatory burden on top of the ones that are already being grappled with. Thank you. Well, there's so much to do, isn't there? And it's so exciting we could talk on and on, but I think we're actually out of time now. Uh, could I just everybody, uh, ask everybody to thank uh, uh, Joe and uh, Wayne for their time this morning? It's been <laughs>